Uh, we are so glad uh, you are all able to join us this morning uh, as we begin this uh, really important speaker series. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to share that all of the talks and sessions as a part of our Decolonizing Sustainability speaker series uh, last year are all available on our YouTube channel, uh, Native American Studies at Cal Poly Humboldt. Um, so if you haven't been able to catch up on the webinars we've held in the past, those are all available to you on our YouTube channel. Uh, my name is Caitlin Reed. I'm an assistant professor with Indigenous Peoples, Places, and Knowledge Systems. Uh, before I introduce our speaker for today, I'd like to begin uh, with a land acknowledgement. If folks wouldn't mind sharing in the chat well, whose ancestral territory uh, you are joining us from today, that would be great. Uh, if you don't know whose ancestral territory you live on, uh, you can find out at the website in the chat. And if you live in the United States, you can text the following number uh, uh, and your zip code and you'll, they'll tell you whose territory you are currently residing on. Uh, so if folks want to share that with us in the chat, we'd love to see where everybody is joining us from today. Um, Cal Poly Humboldt, uh, where I am uh, joining us from this afternoon, occupies the unceded land of Wiat peoples. This includes the Wiat tribe, the Bear River Rancheria, and the Blue Lake Rancheria. Uh, Gutdini, meaning over in the woods or among the redwoods, was renamed Arcata by settlers in 1860. But despite this, Wiat peoples maintain connections to their territory through ceremony, culture, and stewardship. We are peoples are central not only to the history of this place, but the future of this place. Uh, as Dr. Kacha Rizling Baldi so eloquently articulates in her lecture, what good is a land acknowledgement? Uh, if land acknowledgements don't come with action items, uh, they're merely performative, right? And therefore meaningless. So I have a few action items that folks can take advantage of today. For all the students in the audience, here's a free one. Uh, you can go follow the We Out Tribe on Facebook, stay updated on news that's coming out of the, uh, that tribal nation, uh, and keep yourself informed. You can also follow Native American Studies uh, here at Cal Poly Humble on our social and uh, stay informed on events such as this one uh, and uh, come to those. For faculty and staff in the audience, uh, you can pay the We Out Honor Tax. The link is available to you in the chat below. Uh, and folks can also donate to the Rue Dallager Food Sovereignty Lab uh, and Traditional Ecological Knowledges Institute uh, as another action item. Uh, I have a couple of housekeeping notes before we get started this morning. Uh, you have an opportunity to ask questions of our speaker today. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A button. You can click that, enter your question there. Uh, folks can also throw it into the chat and I'll keep an eye on those. If you're joining us from Facebook, welcome. Uh, you can put in your questions as a comment on Facebook and I'll keep track of those as well. Uh, and my next uh, housekeeping note is that we will have a recording of this session available uh, on our Facebook channel as well as our YouTube channel uh, for folks who uh, can't catch all of the session today and want to find out what they missed. All right. I think those are all of my housekeeping notes. Uh, so I'm very excited uh, to introduce our speaker today, uh, Don Blake. Don Blake's presentation today is titled Forest Health is Human Health, Indigenous Forestry and Place-Based Solutions. Uh, Don is an enrolled Hoopa Valley tribal member and Yurok descendant with a master's of science degree in natural resources from now Cal Poly Humboldt. So an alum in the house, great to see. Uh, Dawn is well-versed in all aspects of modern forest management. She is currently the Yurok Forestry Director and manages more than 70,000 acres of Yurok-owned forest for the benefit of current and future generations of Yurok people. She oversees the tribe's 15,000 acre old growth forest and salmon sanctuary on Blue Creek, a critically important tributary of the Klamath River. She also administers sustainable and selective timber harvest and thinning operations. She is well acquainted with the threats facing California's natural resources and rural communities, such as the recent record-breaking wildfires. 
More importantly, she is passionate about resolving these risks to California's residents and resources. And this past September, Dawn became the first Native American woman appointed to the California State Board of Forestry and Fire Protection. Uh, please join me in congratulating and welcoming our first speaker of the Decolonizing Sustainability, Sustainability Speaker Series. Uh, Dawn, the floor is yours. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you for the warm welcome. I really appreciate the the energy that comes out of Cal Poly Humboldt and our, you know, our native, um, you know, connections there. I'm really, I'm really um, happy to see some of the, you know, some of the, the, um, the things that initiate there and really get gain traction, you know, so that um, in my little remote neck of the woods, I'm, I'm still following along and, and trying to keep up with the forward movement. <laughs> um, I'm not really, I can't remember the last time I did a presentation through Zoom, but um, I have this um, PowerPoint and do I just click on it and then that's going to Yep, you'll click the, it'll, it'll say share screen and it should be green right in the center. Okay. And then I'll let you know that we can see it. Okay, let me see. This share screen. Okay, where's that gonna be? Display settings? Uh, no, at the bottom. So uh, you'll see uh, just in the bottom of your Zoom window. So you, where you see participants, chat, and then it's share screen. I think I jumped the gun and maybe I need to close out of the presentation first. Okay. If you want to share it with me, I'm also happy to screen share it on your behalf and you can just say next slide, next slide. Okay, let's see. Share screen. Okay. And perfect. You're a pro. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Is that up for everyone? Um, so we see your notes version. If that's okay with you, uh, you can leave it. Otherwise, you'll click display settings and you'll just change it around. Okay. How do I get out of the notes version? Um, I think maybe if you click display settings on top. I can't reach it with my mouse. I think I need to... <laughs> so what was my other option sharing the screen with you um well we can see your slides uh the only thing is we can see your next slide also so if you don't want us to be able to see your next slide uh we'll we'll have to change it but if you don't mind then I think you could present as is if you'd like okay I got my mouse onto my screen now so the display settings yeah, on top, just to the left of end slideshow. There you go. Yeah. Participants. Oh, it's behind something. Okay. Yeah, just swap presenter view and slideshow. That should do it. Okay. Let's hope. Okay. Perfect. Great. Okay. We did it. <laughs> Whoops. Okay. <clears throat> so I guess I'll just introduce myself again. My name's Dawn Blake. I'm the Yurok Tribe Forestry Director. The Forestry Department is nested within the Natural Resources Division in the Yurok Tribe's infrastructure in the Re Natural Resources Division um, that houses fisheries, forestry, wildlife, um, watershed and carbon. And I hope I didn't forget any of my important departments, but I think that's it. Um, so as we're talking about um, human health and forest health, I just considered for a minute, you know, the, um, the health of the pe my people and just looked at some quick statistics to see where we were 
with our representation of the U.S. population, and um, we're about 2% of the overall population of the United States. And um, off the top of my head, as I was putting this slide together, I just threw a few um, diseases on here that I know affect our community, but, um, but I was able to find that on the internet, um, that heart disease, cirrhosis, and accidents are the um, three leading causes of death for, um, for Native Americans currently. And then, and also respiratory diseases, I switched that out. I don't remember what I had in there, but I had to leave suicide in there because that just seems like something that really um, skews or affects our, um, our mortality. And um, oh, what is it called? Life expectancy. So um, you know, I, I just spent a little bit of time poking around on the internet to find out, you know, what our current life expectancy is, and that's about 71, 71. And so I found that um, right now, that is quite a bit lower, I think, approximately nine years lower than, than the white population, and then also lower than Hispanics and Blacks as well. Um, so that kind of paints a, a grim picture, I guess, but just something that I think is residual from, you know, as we know, our historical traumas and things that we're still trying to um, come to terms with. But I think that we do a pretty good job in building resilience. And, you know, we still have, we still have a lot to be proud of and a lot to fight for. And I think that I definitely recognize that there's ways to increase this resilience. And I've been thinking about this a lot lately and my position on the U Hoopa Tribe Educate Board of Education Board of Directors, um, you know, we've been considering trauma-informed care as a way to increase resilience for our um, youth population. And one of the ways, one of the successful ways to do that is to really introduce a lot of culture and just provide a lot of opportunity for the youth to participate in culture. Um, and that increases identity. But one of the things that, you know, kind of gets left out in modern society is also our um, spirituality. So, um, so it's really good for our kids to learn how to do math and writing and to graduate and to be, you know, productive members of society and be able to, um, you know, be able to take care of themselves. But I think that because we have this, you know, really we're in this really high risk category, taking care of ourselves means more than just learning the basics at elementary and high school. So we really have to nurture our culture in order for, um, for our, our health and growth. <clears throat> so um, on that same note, building resilience in the forest is really important for us. And that affects us in so many ways. It's, um, you know, it affects us directly because if the forest doesn't have good resilience to things like fire and diseases, then that can have a direct impact on us as a people. So in the forced assimilation in the, you know, past decades, um, we've really kind of gone away, not by our own, our own choice of from things that we really relied on that were directly um, related to the health of the forest, like, you know, our foods, medicines, going out and for and foraging. So that um, <laughs> when I'm when I'm making the comparison in in today's society between how we were always on the landscape, you know, navigating that and um, and and doing that that was really healthy for us. You know, that was exercise 
and um, and building this relationship to not only the landscape, but, um, you know, to these various food sources that ends up also being really a healthy thing to do. Um, and so that really just makes me consider, you know, how I would like to spend my time as a forestry director. Um, restoration is becoming, you know, um, really important. And suddenly there's a lot of of money for restoration. Um, and so um, I'm just considering, I came back from last week, I was down at the California Native Plant Society Conference and listening to a lot of the, the stories on, on restoration in various um, different counties. And, you know, it's nice that in recent years, a lot of, um, there's a lot of restoration happening where, you know, um, the, the fuels are being addressed mecha both mechanically and then with prescribed fire. So um, it feels like in a lot of, in a lot of senses, it feels like, um, you know, we're trying to take a snapshot um, for science purpose and, and make an assessment of, you know, the benefits or, or detriments of putting fire on the landscape. And that really um, concerns me because I think that we desperately need to get fire back on the landscape and at a much larger scale. So I'm really happy that a lot of, um, you know, agencies and just the sentiment about prescribed fire is increasing. There's a lot more awareness about it. Um, you know, before, you know, in, in the last few decades, I guess in the last couple of decades, there weren't a lot of people who were versed in it. And I've always heard that, well, you need to, you need to reduce the fuels so much before you ever go in there with prescribed fire. And, um, and that just seemed like such, um, it just really seemed like that was something that was in the distant future to, to us and where I was in my career. And so I'm really, it's really refreshing to hear so many agencies and people all together talking about the need to get prescribed fire. So I think it's great. And I think that the, the, you know, the traction that it's gaining and, um, and that we have so many participants in it. I just came from the, my third board of forestry meeting and at every meeting they're talking about, you know, individual people who work for Cal Fire are talking about their wonderful experience at Trex you know, they're, they're going and volunteering their time there to learn about cultural burns and then coming back with a, you know, kind of a, um, a, a greater knowledge about the, the ways that natives want to use fire on the landscape. And so I guess just my point is that that's all really great. <laughs> these, these small prescribed burns as they increase are really good for our land um, but we really need more of it and at a larger scale. So, um, so I'd just like to have that discussion more often. And so the wondering about um, science and looking at the snapshot since we haven't had, since there's been fire exclusion for so long, I really am concerned at, at just considering the snapshot right now. And so at this conference that I came from, there was a lot of talk about, you know, species, diversity, and richness. And those are just common ways that you can assess, um, you know, the vegetation in, a, in, a sci in science. And so that really got me thinking about, you know, since fire's been excluded from the landscape for the last hundred years, and we're taking a snapshot right now, I don't, I'd really like to know, and there aren't any answers for how um, the species diversity and richness right now, it differs from what it was when the land was continually managed with fire um, for all those centuries before fire exclusion happened. So in those hundred years, what 
how could that have filled in? Do we have more of a homogenous landscape now because no, because just the management essentially stopped altogether? And um, I don't feel like there's ever going to be any answer for that. So it's always going to just be my question back to those who are trying to um, to get answers in, in a scientific fashion. But maybe we can start to, um, to broaden our questions. I'm not sure what the answer to that is, what kind of hypothesis is going to capture what I'm looking for. But it's just something to think about and something that I've considered. Whoops. Okay. So more of resilience. Oh, this is what I just went into. I didn't realize that this was my next slide, but I think I just said all of this stuff. So the, the photo is um, of basketry material. Um, and those are the things that we really um, promoted. So maybe there weren't as many species of everything in the species um, composition um, wasn't at, you know, a height, but these things that we really depended on, basketry materials and medicines and foods, you know, those are the things that we were deliberately promoting. Much like in today's society, the timber companies are deliberately promoting, you know, trees to grow them fast and to be able to sell them because in today's society, that's how you eat. You, you make industry out of, out of that. So this is kind of at a smaller and more personalized scale for us, um, but we were definitely managing for what we wanted out of the landscape. <clears throat> um, I just wanted to um, share these objectives of the National Resource Management Act because I think that I think that as I came into this um, forestry director position, I realized that there is kind of a um, I competing or maybe even conflicting. Um, objective that we're that we're going for. So the stuff that I was just describing, that's not really in this in this. Um, that's not what really the Congress passed on behalf of Native Americans for forest management. So we're looking at one through seven and considering um, maintaining the forest land perpetually, um, you know, for productivity, um, for marketing objectives, um, again, productivity and perpetual forest business, added value, um, you know, of the, of the forest commodities. Um, this one, retention, I, I can't read it because the, this, Oh, maybe I can. Let's see. <clears throat> um, retention of such land in its natural state when Indian tribe determines that the recreational, cultural, aesthetic, and traditional values of the land represents it, its best use. Um, I think that's all the all the stuff that I described, and I think that's something that tri were, was really important to, for tribes when this was passed. And I do recognize also that this was passed because tribes were coming forward forward with these needs, but um, you know, I think that where we are today in talking about how we use the forest in order for the forest to become more useful to us and for us to maintain this connection to it, this number five can't be such a luxury. It has to be more of a management goal, um, and then protection of forest resources by regulating water runoff soil, the improvement of timber productivity, grazing, wildlife fisheries, and specified traditional values. So um, I think that's all really pretty compelling, but I just wanted to in include this as a slide to recognize that, you know, that was 
that was a really great thing that happened for for us in the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s. But you know, we're um, we're realizing in the decades since then that um, that we need more, and and that there the I feel like what um, what that was in response to was the management of the past couple of decades. So now that I've been in this field for a little while, I realize that these decades these decades go by fast. And what I want to do in my position right now is respond is in response to the management of the last couple of decades. And so um, I would love to be able to tear on tear with that act and then move to the next level. And I think that's um, along the lines of landscape fire management. <clears throat> so ecosystem, I wonder if I can put this. I'm borrowing someone's office and I was able to just plug right into their whole system. Mouse and all. But I'm having a hard time figuring out where the mouse comes onto my laptop <laughs> and the direction. Okay, so um, ecosystem. This has been a, a discussion for a while that, you know, I think that we're moving from or have already moved moved from the concept that um, wilderness is without people. I think that it's pretty well understood at this point that humans are part of the ecosystem and our indigenous management was ecosystem, um, was also part of the ecosystem. We're part of the ecosystem and the services that we, we provided to the ecosystem um, was important for, for everything that surrounds us now. Um, whether that be the, just everything, everything's interconnected. So as part of the ecosystem, we're entwined in this, in this, um, suite of, of interconnection, like the, mycelium and the uh, mycorrhizal um, associations. So I just wanted to describe ecosystem services a little more. I'm not sure who my audience is. I can't really see um, who's participating in this, but um, at my graduate lab here at Cal Poly Humboldt, um, that lab, Matt Johnson's lab, is especially in, interested in ecosystem services. So I attended a lot of these presentations that had to do with ecosystem services. So, um, you know, Matt and his career has looked at um, birds and how they, on farms, um, often provide ecosystem services to farms that is beneficial to humans because rather than having to, hopefully rather than having to put a lot of money into pesticides, you have a natural pesticide by promoting birds going onto farms and then birds eat the, the pests that, um, you know, damage the crop. And so that's an ecosystem service. Another example of ecosystem services that, that, my lab looks at are um, barn owls and promote putting barn owl boxes at farms so that barn owls have a place to um, to rest and and nest and then hopefully they um, are able to have an effect on the rodent population. And then another ecosystem service that my lab studied was in Hoopa, the, the 
<laughs> in when I first came to my job in, as a wildlife technician in Hoopa, there was an emerging problem with bears eating the, the trees. And as Hoopa um, had a forest industry, that seemed like it was going to be costly in the millions in the in the future. So bears were damaging the trees and um, and that was just going to seem like a total loss. So at a, about 20 years later, one of my um, labbies and coworkers um, did her graduate research on on the the bear damage in these what were large clear cuts of the 80s. So in those large clear cuts, that was, there was still um, pesticide application during those times. So one of the first things that, um, that really made an impression on me when I started there was that, um, that these expansive um, forests were basically only trees. And my boss, called them sterile environments because there weren't, you couldn't really hear birds in there. You couldn't really see bugs. There was just like not a lot of animals moving around rodents or anything. So the ecosystem kind of broke down when this forest was only grown to be trees or, 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 um, or just growing trees really fast. And then the, the, the other, life forces in this forest are just, it's devoid of these other life forces. So, um, you know, after, after 20 or more years, um, where the bears were going in and, and killing trees partially or damaging or killing trees, it's providing dead, standing dead trees, which, um, welcomes in bugs, which welcomes in birds and woodpeckers and, Suddenly, you know, we didn't see this coming, but suddenly the bears are providing an ecosystem service that is ends up being important to us um, culturally because woodpeckers are um, are a cultural icon. So that's an example of ecosystem services. And I wanted to make that comparison with, um, with the animals and how animals provide ecosystem services, but humans also provide ecosystem services. And that's what I was talking about. So before I go back into that discussion, I hope I remember to, but um, woodpeckers also provide ecosystem services. So... As you may know, woodpeckers put um, cavities into trees, and those cavities provision habitat for other animals. There are there's a large list of animals that use the cavities that woodpeckers put in, and it's relative to the size of the woodpecker. The size of the woodpecker determines the size of the cavity, determines the size of the animal that would use that cavity, and um, so. You know, pileated woodpeckers put in the largest cavities, and so you would expect the animals that use those cavities to be larger animals like squirrels, fishers, um, but downy woodpeckers on the other end of the size spectrum for the representative woodpeckers put in really small cavities, and then small animals would be expected to use those cavities. So like... um, Western bluebirds, or maybe um, some species of owls. Um, Anyway, woodpeckers put in a lot of work to put in these cavities throughout the forest, and these cavities end up being highly important to a number of animals to be able to, this habitat wouldn't exist for animals to nest, roost, um, reproduce, den, if not for the work of these woodpeckers. So when you have a forest that's devoid of these trees that a woodpecker is going to want to put a cavity in in the first place, they usually, I mean, they always put cavities into trees that already have a little bit of heart rot. So they know somehow, somehow they have a sense for a tree that has heart rot. So this this picture is really interesting because it's a live tree 
and often they want to use dead trees because um, because they definitely are going to have rot inside and there's definitely going to be, you know, when they excavate into it, it's going to be a little bit easier to um, take the material out of it and to provide this space. So when a live tree is used, they just have some sense for um, for the rot that exists within the tree. And so that the rot ends up being kind of important. I think that's kind of counter, counterintuitive if you um, don't know much about the forest or, you know, <laughs> in talking to a lot of foresters, I hear, I hear about um, healthy trees a lot. And, you know, in a lot of projects, people want to remove the unhealthy trees and promote the healthy trees. And, um, and I'm kind of the opposite of that. We need some unhealthy trees because this provides for woodpeckers and then the habitat for so many other animals. So, I mean, I read not too long ago, I read, it wasn't definitive. And I think that if I research this a little bit more, I'll have, a, I'll have um, a better understanding of it, but it was enough to read that um, and make the correlation that a lot of the animals that are in peril right now are cavity nesting or dinning animals. And, um, and that's to be expected. And I think that woodpeckers really do great. And, you know, the tribes, um, we want woodpeckers on the landscape. So we definitely are promoting snags and promoting habitat for woodpeckers. So that in turn helps a lot out uh, the entire ecosystem of, of animals. Um, but cavities and, and that, that heart rot that occurs within a tree that needs some initiation too. And we need recruitment of that. And so that's how natives are ecosystem engineers, because there's only a few ways for a cavity to occur. You know, there has to be some rot and per sometimes limbs come off trees. Sometimes there's some kind of damage from another tree falling down, scarring the tree, allowing the opening for the inoculation of, um, of this heart rot to enter the tree. Um, but another way is by prescribed fire. So these fire scars open up the open, give an opening and allow for this inoculation to happen. And so too many healthy trees is not a good thing to animals. And, you know, in my, in my schooling, I always heard that, you know, dead and dying trees were really important, but just I'm realizing that the recruitment of those dead and dying trees is a really long process and um, and we don't have another hundred years to um, to <laughs> to help along that process without fire being part of the equation and without humans being a part of the equation. So um, for that, our relationships to the relationship to the landscape is really important. And um, all these things that we rely on the forest for, um, these are just, you know, again, just a few off the top of my head, acorns, deer, fish, basketry, huckleberries. I included this picture of my sister who recently started making, I think she's been making baskets, baby baskets for a couple of years. It may be, may be more than a couple of years by now, but um, I'm really just, I'm really just so pleased at, at her relationship and understanding, you know, what time of year to gather her basketry material, her putting herself in the right frame of mind to, um, to sit down and weave something. It lends to her, to her own health to both go out and gather the basketry material and then also work with the basketry material. And so that's kind of been my spiel for the last few years is that the relationship is so important. Fish, you know, fish, when people fish and go out and actually are going on to the water, getting their own fish, processing it themselves, you're just without thinking about it, you're developing this relationship with this animal that is really important to us and 
Um, and you just, you can't help to appreciate something when you spend so much time with it. You know, you begin to appreciate the morphology of it, the differences, the individual variation, and that ends up just being relationship. So, you know, I feel like we need to make a concerted effort into making and promoting these relationships rather than just, you know, when you go to the grocery store and get your meat out of a package and you're only looking at this packaged meat, you don't really make the association that this packaged meat was once an animal. And so, you know, I don't really feel that much relationship to my hamburger or realize I do realize that it came from a cow, but just I'm so removed from the process that, you know, it just, it doesn't, it loses some meaning. So, um, I'm recognizing that, and I'm kind of jumping around the earlier slide that I that I put up about the um, the Forest Management Act. Um, the there's a recognizable lag that I'm seeing, and so this is an example of the old clear cuts, and this one was um, done by the Bureau of Indian Affairs, but during that time there was a lot of clear cuts throughout the United States because the forest service was making large clear cuts. And just, this was the thing to do as the technology and the, um, and the equipment um, updated to be able to handle this kind of um, material, um, then it happened quickly. So, um, so these large clear cuts were something that the public didn't want to see. And so as my career was starting, these large clear cut, clear cuts was kind of a bad word, you know, and a, had a, ne a very negative connotation. And, um, and that was because of what had happened in the, in the decades prior to that. And so I think where we are in that time frame, um, when I was starting school, you know, people were really interested in having trees on the landscape. Nobody wanted to look at these expansive clear cuts and everyone was afraid that we weren't gonna have trees if these, if these clear cuts kept happening. And so we really laid off from cutting a lot. And I think that we didn't realize what was gonna happen <laughs> in the decades to come that followed. Um, and so now we have a lot of trees on the landscape that are posing a problem for fire and because, uh, and then also the, the expansive clear cuts really contribute to that too, because you have these expanses of even aged management and, um, and at least, at least they are kind of coming back into rotation where they're building up some fire resilience, but um, as these um, as these landscapes were slicked off and then replanted, they're replanted at at a level, you know, that created competition, and just at a level of growing growing as many trees as you possibly can. And so that's kind of my um, <laughs> how my lens has changed in recent years, looking out and recognizing. The relative, the relative um, age of a tree, um, and a tree, a Douglas fir tree, as we're looking at right here, doesn't start getting resistance or resilient to fire until approximately thirty years of age, and um, and so forests that are grown in even aged management or any management forests that are young are really not fire resilient. And that's just becoming an increasing problem. <clears throat> so as there's suddenly money available for these treatments, I haven't been, or I may not be able to, um, to see the questions can you just let me know if there are any questions and I can address them? I don't. Yeah, we'll have uh, we'll have time for questions when you conclude your presentation. Okay. <clears throat> so, 
so suddenly there's money available for, for treatments, but, um, you know, there's still a lot of things to consider, um, you know, that this is the lag that I'm talking about. Also, there's suddenly a lot of money available for treatments. And so everyone wants to treat the landscape, but then everyone's having the same problem with, well, wait, <laughs> this is great, you know, and we're able to reduce the fuel and hopefully reduce the, um, the fire threat, but not all the way, because what do you do with the slash? And there's so much of it that comes about from even restoration projects. And the lag exists that, um, you know, while we were trying to save trees and um, on the landscape, there isn't the infrastructure available to be able to address these other things. So, um, so slash that is, is, that comes off of any of these projects, logging projects or restoration projects is just a tremendous um, feat for any manager to have to deal with when there isn't a clear answer or an equitable way to deal with the byproduct. <clears throat> um, I think the place based is just is just um, in theme with everything that I've talked about so far. I really commend the Yurok tribe for um, for making it a point to um, to hire people into these positions, like my position, who have a connection to the landscape already. So you know, in the in the environmental environmental protection. Um, agency or department within the Yurok tribe. Louisa McCovey is the director there. Barry McCovey is the director of the fisheries department. Um, Rich Nelson is the director of watershed. Javier Kinney, the um, director of carbon. Tiana Williams is the director of the wildlife department. And so that just, it's like a, uh, I'm really proud to be among that group of people who are operating out of their passion and um, and and trying to do something good for the connection to the landscape and for their people and for this relationship that is a continuum. And so then that leads me to um, to the idea of treating the landscape when you're, when someone else comes in and this goes for anywhere, when you go and work somewhere in someone else's forest, it takes a minute for you to acclimate to that forest and have an understanding of that system, as opposed to the one that you came from. I suppose this, I mean, I've, I've spoken to other um, forest managers who have gone to a few different forests and really, um, and really got to know those systems but you know that takes decades sometimes and so I really I really appreciate that the Yurok tribe has um has you know just made that a, a value system like the understanding that the best people to be in these positions are people who like already have this connection so I'll go into some of my current projects. Um, we have an oak woodland restoration pro pro project that is approximately 400 acres. It was 500 acres, but we're not really sure how we'll be able to do the, um, if, we, if we'll be able to add the, um, the prairie restoration component in, into that. We may have to, um, we may have to take out that 100 acres of prairie restoration and put that into another project. Um, still working with the State Coastal Conservancy on that, on the grant for that. Um, it's on Highway 169. Um, and it's a really interesting project because it's where a lot of the trex burns happen. So we have a fire pretreatment there and um, and cultural fire has been monitoring um, some of the medicinal and um, and just cultural um, species composition. 
So we'll be able to hopefully be able to do some good before, before pre-post monitoring. Um, we have an actual prairie restoration project. Um, this one was, well, they both were designed before I came on, but um, the prairie restoration project is, um, is actually a thinning um, and the, the, whoever put that project together um, had the idea that we wouldn't, since it was a form, a former prairie that we wouldn't replant that. Um, and so it's not, a prairie restoration project to the level that I would like to do prairie restoration, but we're already so far along in this process with a, a biological assessment and a biological opinion that we'll have to modify that, um, you know, within uh, some set parameters and, um, and try to do what we can out of it. Otherwise, start all over and have it be years out. Um, we've been, I've been closely tied to this Pequon Forest Health Project. It's 800 acres. Um, it is funded by a Cal Fire Forest Health Grant. Um, and we're pretty far along on that one. We're getting ready to go into Section 9 formal consultation with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, I included this photo, which was provided by, um, Joe Hostler, just historical photos from, I think, I'm not really sure when this one, but I think it was 1930s. And I don't have the, <laughs> I don't have the comparison, but um, I love these old photos because they show a different picture than we're looking at today, where there's a lot more openness and you can really recognize the, the tribal management that happened. And in considering that, um, my colleagues and I have discussed that even at that time in the 1930s, there was probably quite a bit of, of fire exclusion happening. So even the earliest um, photographic evidence that we can look at probably still isn't a real representation of the management that was occurring prior to that. And so the openness that we um, are going for was probably even more dramatic than, than this. And this is an, an example of an FVS, forced vegetation simulation simulator model, where the, the forest that we're trying to address is just extraordinarily overgrown. And in on the on the left hand side, the basal area in some in some instances and in many instances is over 300 basal area. And so we're trying to take that down to approximately 80 to 100 basal area on average. And so you can see the difference for what we are going from and what we're trying to um, to go to. And so the, this forest is so dense that um, natural thinning is already happening where um, some trees are out competing others and, and the losers are just falling down and dying. So this is a great example of the lack of management in recent decades and what happens when, you know, when you're not going in and and either doing mechanical treatments or, or treating the landscape with fire. It's just a complete overgrowth and um, really a high risk um, situation for wildfire. And it's on a ridge top. So, you know, this is on ridge tops is where they put fire lines. So there are way too many trees, way too close to each other. Um, in this area and we're trying to address that for both fire resilience. And then it's also going to opening, opening it up in the case of um, hardwoods is also going to release some of the, of the tan oaks. And then those tan oaks that are just competing in this competition for resources are going to be able to switch over into 
reproducing, hopefully. And so that'll create habitat, gathering, um, and just produce altogether a healthier forest ecosystem. And then we have a prescribed fire component included with that. So we're hoping that that will also help the ecosystem by initiating some of those fire scars. I'm not sure <laughs> what my time frame was, whether I went through that quickly or slowly, but I thank you. And do you have any questions? <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Don. That was really, really amazing. Uh, folks in the audience, uh, at the bottom of your screen, you have a button that says Q and A. Uh, you can click that button and you can type your question in there and then we will see them. You can also put it into the chat. And then those of you joining on Facebook, uh, feel free to throw a comment uh, into uh, on the video on Facebook, and then we can ask Don uh, questions from Facebook as well. Uh, I also just want to say there's a lot of gratitude coming in on the chat. Um, Adrian says, thank you, Don. Beautiful presentation. The Yurok tribe is lucky to have you as their current forester. Um, and so while we wait for folks to write their questions, I had a couple of things I wanted to share that I just really loved uh, from your talk. Um, the first thing I really loved was how you drew a connection between resilience of people uh, and resilience of the forest, right, as those two things are connected. And I think that that's really important to remind ourselves. Uh, when you were talking, I was thinking uh, about the connection between human health and forest health. Uh, I was thinking about a photograph uh, from Jack Norton's book. Uh, I'm going to show it to us really quick. Uh, just because I want the, I don't know if the audience has ever seen it before. Um, I was thinking about this photograph when you were talking. Uh, it was published oh, in yeah. Jack Norton's When Our Worlds Cried. Uh, this is a picture of one of the militias that came through Northern California um, in the 1860s. Uh, and the, the, and the redwood that they are all like posed on and when you were talking about the connection between kind of community and people's resilience and forest resilience because i was really thinking about the way in which violence we experienced uh is also connected right as forests are experiencing violence so to yeah. our indigenous peoples and i wanted to like let folks know uh I loved the discussion of fire exclusion uh, you included in your talk. And a lot of folks don't know that a fire suppression clause was included in the 1850 Act, right, for the governance and protection of Indians, right? Mm -hmm. And so thinking about fire exclusion, land theft, right, and violence against Indigenous peoples are all, like, so fundamentally connected. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it makes sense, right, that re community resilience, right, yeah. is going to be fundamentally connected to forest yeah. resilience, so... I just love I think, that. Point. I find that they're inextricably connected. And there was something that I wanted to touch on, but I didn't end up seeing any of my notes. Um, so, <laughs> so I ended up talking, but I wanted to, but I, as I was putting this presentation together, I had a new thought. And that was just that, um, you know, I'm really connected to my foods now. When I was a kid, you know, I was a little bit embarrassed that my family ate traditional foods, that we had fish on the table regularly and deer meat on the ta table regularly and acorns. And, you know, God forbid any of my friends ever coming over and seeing us eat napes. <laughs> because I almost never had um, meatloaf in my entire life as I was growing up in, in my household and those kinds of, you know, food, like, I guess, comfort foods for American people. Um, I felt like that's what all my friends were eating. And um, and so now I've changed as, as I said, my lens has changed and I'm so happy that I grew up on those foods and I have, and I specifically remember the time in my life when, you know, napes, I remember how my grandpa just like, that was the prize of the fish to him and heads. And, um, and so like, he just got so much enjoyment out of sitting down and eating napes. And I remember when I was in my thirties and I was like, oh my God, napes are good. <laughs> and I'm just really super happy and thankful at this point that I still, that, you know, that it was kind of forced on me in my household, but that 
really did um, lend to this relationship that I have with my food now. And that's my preferred food among, I mean, above anything else. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I, I love that you, you share that. Right. And I think when I, when I think of like forest health, like I also think about food sovereignty, right? Mm -hmm. Like a healthy forest means like there are materials, right. That can be gathered and, uh, uh, and eaten. Right. And so I think kind of thinking about fire and forest management, right. Is also really critical to work around food sovereignty, uh, and the work we're doing on campus at the Rue Deliger food sovereignty lab, Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Luisa's on our steering committee uh, for 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 that kind of thinking about the connections right between forest health uh, and food sovereignty. Uh, one other part of your talk that uh, I really got me thinking was when you were talking about the snapshot for science, right? Um, it made me think about baselines uh, for environmental impact reports. Mm -hmm. And they always really frustrate me because like there'll be a a proposal to do some sort of activity. And it's like, well, here's the baseline. We can't worsen, right? Environmental conditions past that point. And I'm like, well, that's not the baseline for the people who have been stewarding these territories for mm-hmm. thousands of years, mm-hmm. right? And so, like, I really like kind of that pushing back against that, like, scientific snapshot, right? Because for our baseline, right, it's all healthy forests managed by fire, right? Like, mm-hmm. our baseline predates, like, the creation of the U.S. Forest Service, right? Um, so I really liked your discussion of Um, the snapshot for science. And then when you brought up the National Resource Management Act, um, I I was kind of struck by the language in that in that policy, specifically Section 5, the one you were talking about, where it's the retention of land in a natural state, Mm -hmm. right, as if Native peoples aren't stewarding territory. Mm -hmm. Uh, I love what you uh, said about Native peoples being ecosystem engineers. Uh, I saved that for for future use. I really like that. Well, I don't want to say too much negative about that act because I definitely recognize that it was um, it was because of the cry of the people. You know, the um, Hoopa took over forest management from the BIA because of that act, and um, and some of my coworkers who I talked, spoke to said, you know, that the Bureau of Indian Affairs, they just never could hear that we wanted to, um, we wanted to preserve basketry materials and to kind of tread lightly in those areas. And so I think that the language has, has to do with that, but I also recognize that where we are today that language doesn't really support the restoration that we need now. So, you know, um, it didn't really have a lot to say about the importance of our oak woodlands. And, and now it's just so obvious how it's just so obvious to me how it was really managed and that every conifer that you're looking at in the oak woodlands are less than a hundred years old. And you can make a direct correlation between, you know, fire exclusion and that conifer encroachment just by looking at these young trees, relatively young trees in the, as you're like traveling on any valley, you know, probably through all of California, you can probably see the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. I think, uh, right. I want, I also, I agree with you, right. That, that, that law was very much needed, right. And a response, right. Um, I, I'll ask one more kind of comment slash question, and then I'll I'll turn over to some of our audience questions that are popping up in the Q&A. Uh, and if you have a question for Dawn, please feel free to drop it into the Q&A and we will be sure to uh, present that. Um, the next thing I wanted to talk about or ask about, uh, one of the themes of your talk was kind of the changing sentiment around fire, right? And you had mentioned, like, it's exciting to see that folks are, like, willing to even have that conversation now, mm-hmm. right? It might not be moving as quickly as we need it to, but at least folks are, like, willing to have the mm-hmm. conversation around prescribed fire management, Um we often uh, I kind of joke with like colleagues of mine that like, oh, now ecologists are like discovering fire, right? Like Columbus <laughs> discovered America, right? Like ignoring kind of millennia worth of knowledge and practice that indigenous yeah. peoples have um, 
been doing right until we get into this situation where it's like oh shoot what do we do now right Mm -hmm. um do you have any thoughts on how we like respectfully and like ethically integrate indigenous knowledges practices traditional ecological knowledge into these same like state structures that are largely responsible for like some of the violence right Mm -hmm. that uh our forests and our people's experienced and so what is it now that you're on the like the state forestry board like what is it like to have conversations about with other folks across the state like about integrating TEK into the work California is doing I know that's a big question but uh. yeah um I haven't considered the TEK because I think that I think of it from my own perspective and that was you know when my grandma was was managing her own basketry um you know the the patches I guess the places where she picked regularly she just lit them up (laughs) you know that was in the 80s and she stopped doing that in the in the late 80s probably and then I think that nobody really burned those areas after she was done because also at the time that she stopped doing that you know the criminalization of um of of putting fire on the landscape really increased so since that time my grandma was like you know driving home from her job at the school and lighting the fire lighting the hillside up and going on home for the night um that (laughs) from then until like the next the next decade then people were really you know going to jail or threatening they were threatened with prison for doing the same thing. And so it's kind of funny to think of my grandmother as an arsonist because she was like the most benevolent creature alive. But, <laughs> um, you know, so that that's, that language is um, also problematic, but I'm, I'm recognizing that there's a shift, you know, in California, there's been some really good legislation passed. I think that a um, challenge is going to be um, how to implement it and um, and really take our place. So I'm not satisfied with agencies helping us put fire on the on the ground. I'm thankful that they do, but we really need our matches back. And I I guess a particular gripe that I have is that um, you know where. This has been our cry for decades. We've been saying this, we've been trying to get through the policies, like trying to figure out where the breakdown is. How does this happen? We're asking, 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 you know, and then at the same time, like, you know, because there's all of a sudden sentiments changed about fire. So agencies are really building up their capacity around us to be able to do prescribed fire. So they, they're like, you know, that is a huge gripe of mine because we should at least be, at the same level as all these agencies that are around us and we still don't have our matches, but they have their matches all the way around us and they're helping us, but that's not enough. I'm sorry. That's not enough. I love that. We need our matches back. We should make t-shirts. <laughs> I, I, I'm pretty, I stole that. <laughs> I don't remember <laughs> if it was from Frank Lake or Chook Chook, but I heard that somewhere. <laughs> That's cool. I love that. Uh, There's a question from an audience member that I think is really connected to what you're just talking about. uh, We're just now talking about. So I'm going to ask a question from Aaron Kelly, faculty in the forestry department here at Cal Poly Humboldt. Uh, Dr. Kelly asks, thank you so much for the talk. When you're working with agencies like on the Pequon Forest Health Project, how do you harmonize tribal and state agency objectives? Do you find that state agencies will take a back seat or do they try to steer the project? Are the agencies learning? Um, Or maybe you have more gripes to to share with us on that one. Um, It seemed like, you know, we've had, we've been involved with the agencies from the beginning because the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service was going to have to provide the biological opinion and then go into Section 9 um, consultation. So they've been a part of the process the whole time, but I could, I, I definitely recognize that there was some discomfort with the idea of, um, there was just some discomfort. So, um, we invited them out for a field trip where we were just made a better setting for having these discussions so that, you know, we can have dialogue and then you have, 
you know, the forest to present, you're showing the problems, you're showing what you're trying to do. And then it doesn't, and then that kind of took, I think that really kind of took away the fear or maybe, you know, I'm not sure, like, I feel like <laughs> maybe I come across pushy in Zoom, but not as much in person. I don't know, maybe I'm pushy in person too, <laughs> or not as pushy as I think in Zoom, but I just felt like, you know, the person, the interpersonal communications was really effective. And it's the same thing as I'm talking about here, relationships are important. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, we have a comment from Elizabeth on Facebook. It's a, not a question, just a comment. I really enjoy hearing Native folks in natural resource management, especially working for tribes. I've spent my career working for the feds in natural resource management, timber and reforestation, and really struggle with a lot with the inner conflict in uh, the agency's mission. I enjoyed hearing your talk about us missing the connection to animals and plants we consume. Missing that connection makes things get twisted way too easily between exploitation and animal rights, anti-hunting action, uh, neither of which are native perspectives. Uh, looking forward to hearing more of this work. Uh, thank you so much. So uh, there's a lot of gratitude coming in on Facebook that I want to share. Um, we have one audience member that has a question uh, around fire resistance in trees. You mentioned that Doug firs become fire resistant at about 30 years old. Uh, does that change for any, any other important uh, species uh, in our region? Um, you know, that's kind of anecdotal I mean it's both anecdotal and something that I that I kind of know but trees um build up thicker bark at at a certain age and I I think it's around 30 years of age I had the unique opportunity on the red salmon fire to go around the um Hoopa reservation has um various cereal stages of the forest that were impacted by the red salmon fire and whether it was with back back burning or where the fire came onto the reservation but um clinton matilton and i took a day uh and just went around and looked at these um various stands to um see how they um responded to the fire and you could and you can just really see that um you have to have it doesn't like the the intensity has to be really really low to not like really damage or negatively affect Douglas fir stands. So um, I know that oaks have that too. I just don't have as great a uh, um, idea about the age of the oak and when it produces that thicker bark. Thank you. Uh, Vicki Preston says, uh, just wanted to say kudos in the fight for snags. They are important on our landscape too, but are hard sells for keeping during wildfire, prescribed fire, logging, et cetera. So uh, <laughs> thank you from Vicki. Um, we have uh, another question uh, from an audience member. Uh, you had mentioned trauma-informed care in your presentation. They're wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about what you mean by trauma-informed care. Um, trauma informed care is this. I'm, I'm not really sure what it is. In some in some cases, it's a, a pedago pedagogy. I can't pronounce that word, but um, where it's been implemented into schools, like um, it's been successful in inner city schools. So it's based on this questionnaire of childhood trauma. I think there are ten or fifteen. I think ten questions um, that have have to do with childhood trauma. So there's a correlation between childhood trauma and things like um, um, smoking cigarettes, experimenting with drugs, just depression. Um, I think the when the doctor or who the researchers first found it, they were looking at obesity and people who were um, obese and went on some regimen to lose weight, they gained it back really quickly when and couldn't keep the weight off when they had these childhood responses. And so then that just led to, you know, the um, a lot more research in this area. So it's based on those adverse childhood um, experiences. And then the trauma informed care, a lot of people don't like the, 
don't like it to be called that. And I think they're looking, they're, they're starting to implement different names for it. But the idea is that if you incorporate this into schools or organizations, the idea is that you are, you can't do anything to take away those um, atrocities. You can't take away someone's um, adverse experiences, but you can incorporate things into your practices that um, help them to build resilience. And so, um, so they find that some of these kids who have really high trauma scores, their brains actually shrink because they're just in fight or flight. So they're not doing anything but surviving. And so, um, so what you want to do at a school is, is, you know, allow a safe place for kids to um, not have to operate in their flight, fight or flight. So, you know, it ends up being that, you know, um, punitive um, actions aren't as important as just, you know, making kids feel safe, like this is a place that they can be okay. Yeah, I think that's really important. I remember reading a report like not that long ago that like California native students had higher like, disproportionate rates of being suspended, uh, mm-hmm. even if the the activity right was like similar to other students, right? And so, um, kind of thinking about how we make educational or classroom spaces, right, places yeah. that were uh, for everybody. I should have I should have said that. And so in these in these brain scan studies, um, you can have success from these shrinking brains into bringing back like activity. So it's, you know, um, when I'm thinking about when I'm thinking about our historical traumas and getting back in touch with our food sources and the things that, you know, that just, you know, are innate in us. I feel like my brain lights up for that stuff and I'm better because of it. And so that's what I want for my people. Totally. Uh, I want to be cognizant that we are running low on time. I'm going to conclude with one final question uh, from one of our audience members. What's your favorite part of being the Yurok uh, forestry director? I really like working at the Yurok tribe. The I like the idea of being able to um, to implement some of these things that are like very near near and dear to my heart. But uh, I say regularly that I really like working for the Yurok tribe because they operate close to their value system, and I am really compelled by the fact that every time they come together, they do it in a good way and start everything off with a prayer. And I feel like that really just grounds you and brings you back to why you're doing this, what you're here, that the, what you're here for, that there are people and everything that you have to consider when you're making your decisions. And um, I, that's still my favorite thing. Well, thank you so, so much for joining us. Uh, I think you are the perfect person to kick off the Decolonizing Sustainability Speaker Series this year. Uh, And just again, congratulations on being the first Native woman to be appointed to the California State Board of Forestry and Fire Protection. That is so exciting. And we're all, uh, we are all rooting for you and watching uh, to see what what great things you do next. Um, so thank you everybody for coming. The recording of today's session will be available on our, uh, the Native American Studies Cal Poly Humboldt Facebook page. And, uh, and then later it'll be available on our YouTube channel. I hope to see you all next Wednesday for our second session. Our second session is called Keepers of the Flame. Native American Cultural Burning and Land Stewardship in California. Uh, And we will be joined by Melinda Adams and Denise Martinez uh, from UC Davis. Um, So we are very excited for our next week's session. Hope to see you there. Have a terrific rest of your Wednesday, everybody. Thank you for coming. Thanks for having me. Our pleasure. Thank you so much. That was awesome.